Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalist. I am Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. And we post a video every Friday. So do hit the subscribe button and of course the alert button so that it'll remind you every week when our video comes up. And if you've got a quick question for Stephen, do put it in the messages below because we do a short every Monday and you will answer those questions. Those I can answer. Now, our setting looks familiar, Stephen Ryan, does it not? It does, rather. I can see an odd begonia behind me. Just a few. Now, we made a video a year ago, I think, with Peter Harris here at the wonderful Tuberous Begonia Garden. But that is not what we're here today for, is it not? No. Because if we cunningly we technology swing and... around and move backwards, what we can see a whole lot of fuchsias. Yes, and that in fact is today's topic. We're going to talk about fuchsias and give you all the background that you'll probably need to know if you're going to grow them well in your own garden. I love fuchsias. I've wanted to make this video forever. You are less than enthusiastic. Uh, one could say almost ambivalent. I mean, I appreciate them as a group of plants, uh, but they're not a group of plants that I engage with much. Having said that, I've got at least a couple of fuchsias in my own garden, so there you know, go. I'm nothing if not inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> Consistently inconsistent. Well, I think without further ado, we should go meet Peter and learn everything you ever want to know about fuchsias. Let's go. Well, it's time to meet Peter. Peter Harris. Peter, stop fiddling with your fuchsias. <laughs> <laughs> and get down here. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Thank you. Oh. Your magpie is going mad. Thank you very much. Now, our viewers might well remember Peter from our begonia epic of last year, <laughs> our most popular video. No pressure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, promise, I promise we'll keep this one down to a minimum. Yeah, yeah, well, at least we'll have all of the information on it, we hope. So we're here to talk about fuchsias because when we were here filming the begonia film last year, yep. right next to the begonias, this is amazing other greenhouse full of fuchsias, which have a very soft spot in my heart. I love fuchsias. So, <laughs> I have been telling Stephen Ryan, we must do a <laughs> yes. story with Peter. And here we are, I'm very okay. happy. Okay, all right, well, should we do, I'd like to hear your story first. Let you, you tell me your story. All right, my story <laughs> is, when I was a child, my grandparents' neighbors grew pelagoniums and fuchsias commercially. I was a little boy and they used to let me wander in the greenhouses and, you know, potter and probably get in the way. But the, um, the sister, who was the fuchsia grower, used to let me take cuttings and I used to root them in a jam jar on the windowsill. And because they were so easy to propagate, yep. and you're young and you see the results so quickly, I was all about fuchsias <laughs> as an eight-year-old. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, my story's almost as romantic. I started growing fuchsias in the 1990s, I believe it would have been. Mm. Um, and uh, I wanted to put a collection together um, my love at that point was as a commercial yeah. interest. I was yeah. in production. So I looked around, I bought where I could buy, um, and I think I amassed a collection back then of about 80 to 90 varieties. Yes. And we, we're still working with pretty much that collection all of these years later. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's uh, the only reason um, that, that I can't expand my collection is I can't find more varieties easily. Mm. Um, I've looked around, but I, I tend to have held it at that 80 varieties, 75 varieties, whatever it is, um, just because of the volumes of collections available. Mm. So is it fair to say then that fuchsias have gone through waves of fashion and the tide turned and a lot of varieties just were lost? Well, when I was a young man, the fuchsia, uh, the fuchsia was a very important commercial plant mm. and we had major fuchsia nurseries in Australia and yep. we had a fuchsia yep. society, which I don't think exists anymore, uh, as far as I know. I remember a collection up near Ballarat, uh, the guy who owned the collection up there, Evan Hines, he, he must have had several hundred varieties and he was importing from America and England and bringing in new cultivars. And he was a passionate grower and his collection was just amazing. Mm. And there were others around. There was a big one in Tasmania. There was a really big grower actually 10, ten minutes or less away from where my nursery is mm. in a little road that's now called Fuchsia Lane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not a fuchsia in sight. Yeah, yeah, not are. a fuchsia in sight. And he had a huge fuchsia nursery there. And, mm. and I think he probably had in excess of two or 300 different named clones. Mm. But yes, they went out of fashion for some reason. I don't know what it was, Peter. What do you think? I, 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 taste change with uh, mm. fashions, clothes. It's, it's all a matter of taste. And um, people just lost, I, I think partly because of the drought, mm. people lost interest in, in that late 1980s, 1990s because of the droughts in Australia. So, so we um, lost contact with a lot of fuchsias because of the watering issues and um, being told by our water suppliers to save water. Mm. Um, 
And would the the tightening of our quarantine regulations too about importation of new plants sort of stop the inflow of new varieties as well? I would probably say yes to an extent. It's made it harder. It, it's made it harder. Quarantine is now in a position where um, it's quite bureaucratic, it's quite expensive, um, and really it's the big players that can afford to bring plants in now. Mm. Uh, the smaller boutique nurseries, and that would have included a lot of these sort of specialist nurseries, it became prohibitive because they wanted to bring something in, but they were only going to perhaps grow a few hundred plants from that original importation. Mm it was never going to pay for itself. So if you're bringing in, I don't know, as an example, the next flower carpet rose that might well in fact be selling in the hundreds of thousands, then there's an economy of scale. But when you're a, a serious collector of plants and your interest is mainly in just bringing in the new ones, yep. Uh, yep. you've either got to be exceedingly wealthy and be able to afford to play that game, or you just can't do it. So a lot of players, I mean, I used to import quite a lot of material and I don't do it anymore or haven't done for some years mm. because it's just become so bureaucratic and mm. difficult to do. Yep. So there you go. So it's really what you can find in this country that's named. Searching around. Yep. There you go. Absolutely. Well, I think we might have to go to the very beginning of the story, the origin of the species and look at some of the early <clears throat> species brought into cultivation and early hybrids. Should we do that? That sounds like a good place to start. Off we go. Off we go. We okay. Well, the first. All right, Peter, I think we need to go right back to the beginning. So let's talk about the genus a little bit. Okay. So uh, Leonard Fuchs, for, for whom the genus was named, he died in 1566. So there's a good chance that the genus was named after him well after he wasn't with us, I have to say, <laughs> because <laughs> the genus didn't really become available or known to the Western world until the 1600s, did it? The so 1600s, uh, look, late, late 16, early 1700s, um, they made their way into Europe primarily England. Yeah. Um, so out of that first import was this little bloke here, Fuchsia trifilum. Now of trifilum, it's one of the species as is procumbens. Yeah. Okay, so, so that there... gives you a sense of just how diverse the group are. Okay, uh, so, so the, the group will go from big trees to right. ground covers. Like this one, Fuchsia procumbens from New Zealand. Yeah. Now in that group, there's 110 species. Now the genus is Base, well, most of the species are basically South American. Um, they, they, New Zealand, South American, um, Tahiti's mm. in, in there as well. Yeah. yeah. And certainly from the breeding perspective, and we'll talk about the hybrid one shortly, they were mainly bred from South American species. Basically, yeah, from, yeah. from that first import. In fact, I've got a story. Um, I've got now, a story. Could, may I just say, now all fuchsias mm. are in, in, in the flatlands. They really are understory plants, yeah. which so means... They're shade lovers. They're shade loving, yeah. dappled light yeah. lovers. Not right. full sun. Now, your My story, story uh, which is about the introduction. Now, I don't, this is a story. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I love it nonetheless. Uh, I read or heard somewhere that some of the very early fuchsias uh, were brought in from the Americas by sailors. They'd, they'd take cuttings or they'd bring little plants back that they uh, had found when they're in the Americas and they'd bring them back for their loved ones. And early fuchsia propagation was said to have happened by a canny nurseryman walking along a street in London somewhere and seeing a fuchsia in a lady's windowsill uh, flowering its little head off and going in and offering her some outrageous amount of guineas for this particular plant, taking it away and propagating it up and therefore populate, oh, popularising the fuchsia. And whether it's a true story or not, I don't care. I think it's really fantastic. So there you go. Oh, look, I agree. That's a great story. <laughs> now, may I tell you my story? All right. Why don't you, Peter? <laughs> okay. My story is goes along the lines something like the first fuchsias appeared in England around about the end, really, of the 17th century. Yep. And the propagation of them, the first modern hybrids as we're talking about today, whether they be the doubles or the singles, cropped up around about 1830 to 1835. Mm. However, I like your story more. <laughs> and here we have Fuchsia denticulata. Now, Peter, would you say that this one is reasonably interesting and unique in the fact that it's got green tips? Look, so far as where did that green come from? Why hasn't anybody bred a green fuchsia yet? 
um, there there's we go. a job. <laughs> but there's another job. I'll put yes. that on the list, Stephen. Yeah. Um, denticulata, it's, it's an evergreen one. It's not winter affected. It will grow mm. to about, I've seen them about three metres tall. Now, when you say not winter affected, this is still not when we consider our viewers from all around the world. So far as in the Australian winter, yeah. we go down to minus eight here. I can actually get this one through winter with very little protection. Yeah, so it's reasonably yeah. cold. Huh? Or the Australian climate, yeah. yeah. Yeah, And I quite like some of the species stuff. And certainly in fuchsias, I remember being, I mean, I want this plant and I'm sure it's not here. There is a fuchsia growing in the desert of Chile. Uh, in the lower reaches, the Atacama Desert, I saw a plant, heads of tiny little pink flowers, but in big heads. Oh, clusters of them. Yeah, yep. clusters yep. of them. Small bush, and it was growing out in the desert. But can you imagine the value of a fuchsia that was drought tolerant? Absolutely. And so, like Australia. yeah, we need some more of the species. Peter. Right, Matthew. So fuchsias come in two forms. They yes. basically come in the single form. So when we say single form, we mean a simple little hose fuchsia. So it's a little yep. little round hula skirt yep. and some, some petals on the outside. And the name of this variety? This variety is Lord Byron. Lord Byron. Beautiful um, purple Lo and red. Lovely purples and yep. reds. And then we go to the doubles. So the doubles are hoses within hoses within hoses. So you mm. basically get like a ballerina's uh, yep. tutu. And let's we, that get, we get many, many form ruffles of, of petals inside. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. Now, and but, what's this one called? Sorry. This one's called La Rosita. Right. So, so fuchsias, it doesn't matter if they're singles or doubles, yep. they all give you great bang for buck. They so, do. when you're purchasing a fuchsia, whether they're a single or a double, doesn't matter on how they flower, they all flower the same. Excellent. So, Matthew, fuchsias come in many different colours. So, we do. have everything. No, from we don't. Pure white, right the way through to purples. Hmm. That's really the spectrum, though, of white, red, pink, pink purples. Um, so that uh, doesn't really include yellow. There's no yellows. There, there are the bits of species with bits yes, of green on them. Yes, yeah. um, which Stephen showed you. So it's you really, really within a similar sort of soft pink, soft like, pinky, yeah, ready yeah, family. Yeah. 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 Yep. But no the, oranges. Oh yeah, there are oranges. We get orange. You're calling the orange anyway. I'll right. argue that point later on. Right. But we I will. Think one of the things you were mentioning, and I bought a fuchsia from you at the last um, plant fair. Did it grow? It, it did, it's still alive and it's very happy. But you did point out how the colour changes of the bloom depending upon the light. Okay. And I think we now, have got here, let me I'll, put these down. I'll put those away, Matthew. So behind us, and we'll come in and show you closely, on the same plant, two different yep. colour flowers. Okay, so, Tell right, the, the story is, same plant. Okay. And they look They're completely and different. We, we have two totally different flowers. We're not yep. playing a trick. We haven't put two different plants into a pot. Yes. It's simply because of the sun intensity. Okay. So the more bright sunlight we have, yeah. the truer the colour will be to its natural described colour. Right. The cloudier, more overcast it is, the paler the flower will be. So I'm confused. Same plant, same conditions. Why are they not all the same colour? Mother Nature. But also with fuchsias, the flower colours on the same plant can change with age. Aha. Uh -huh. So do people ever complain to you and say, Peter Harris, I bought a deep magenta fuchsia and it's now hot pink or whatever. Yes, yes, we do or get pale. We do get complaints. We get complaints with basically the purples yeah. um, and, and the blues. And it really is, depends on where in Australia they're living. Mm. The Queensland guys with much more sunlight mm. tend to flower them a lot truer to form. Mm. The cloudy, like the closer we get to New South Wales, they tend not to flower correctly. How but the prescribed colours, it's, it's another one of those things Mother Nature does to us to upset us and keep the complaints part of the business <laughs> busy. <laughs> well, talking of business, we might wander into your propagation area now and talk all things care, maintenance, propagation. I'll show you my secrets and we'll keep it as short and to the point as possible, Matthew. Let's go. All right, let's all right, go. Now, Peter, fuchsias I've always considered to be fairly straightforward in the sense of propagating them, but let's yep. talk through the basic principles of them. Okay, the basic principles with fuchsias and all cuttings are it comes in softwood. Yeah. So we'll take the softwood cutting. And yeah. the softwood is typically the top soft piece of the plant so it's the growing tip and generally its first set of leaves so here we have our little softwood cutting you can see there that it's uh it's got a lower set of leaves it's got its growing tip is still there and it's got a flower bud right there which of course we'll remove 
Okay, so there's our softwood cutting, unprepared. There's our semi-hardwood cutting, unprepared, number two. And the last that we did was the hardwood cutting, still unprepared, number three. Okay, so Stephen, because we've taken our cuttings, the general rule with all leafy cuttings is we need to remove two thirds of the foliage. Yeah. Right, so by doing that, we're going to take these two leaves off just before where they attach to the stem yep. because there are still little buds down there. We want those buds for our insurance exactly. policy. Exactly, and you don't want to damage those. And we don't want to damage those. So let's take our trusty, clean, no yep. expense expared secateurs and remove them. And again, remove them. It's yep. got its flower buds. We need to remove those. Yep. Now, you will destroy this cutting if you try and get, there's a little tiny one there. If you try and get that out, our fingers are too big. You're not going to get that one out. We need to remove this one, pinch it out. That's fine. Mother Nature will preserve the rest of this stem. And of course, we need to remove a third to two thirds of this foliage of the as foliage well. area as well. So we go back, snip, and back, snip. So we've taken them off and there's the prepared cutting, and there's the foliage we remove. So you've got the, the reddish colour of the bark of the and the buds heart. And the buds are a little bit more advanced down here. We'll yeah. keep those buds on, of course. Yeah. Um, but fuchsia is also one of those plants that have more than one set of buds at the leaf area. There'll mm -hmm. be two or three sets of buds there. It's an yeah. insurance policy of the plant. All right, so this is the hardwood cutting we've got here. So you can see that this has got quite brown bark on it now, and it's got these little twigs here uh, above the node. Now it's got little shoots at the base of the cutting so we'll take those off and of course Peter mentioned before that fuchsias actually have extra sets of buds in behind there so there will be new shoots that come from that point. All right and then of course we've got to deal with the top leaves. Now you could possibly take those leaves off Absolutely. altogether yep. which is what I would probably do get them out of the way and try not to cut off the stems while I'm <laughs> at it and then just clean up what leaves are there by about half or so and then we have another cutting. A hardwood cutting. A hardwood cutting ready to go in. Because okay, so Stephen, we've prepared our softwood, semi-hardwood and hardwood cuttings. Right. So now we need to put them in to get roots on them. We use a 70% peat moss and a 30% perlite mix. Mm -hmm. And the reason we put the perlite in it is just to open it up. Fuchsias mm -hmm. do not like wet feet. But it's not a soil-based mix. No it's soil. It's a peat-based mix. Peat moss-based yeah. mix, yeah. Or, or, you know, you, these days a lot of that cocoa fibres out there, it's all the same sort of thing. So with our cutting, we really want to put, it doesn't matter whether they're softwood, semi-hardwood or hardwood, we really want to put three quarters of the stem and that bottom bud mm -hmm. under the soil surface. And we just want to leave the top a little bit out. All right, now, before before we do that though, the other question to ask, and yes. this is something people will ask, um, do you ever need, or is it detrimental in fact, to use any of the rooting hormone preparations? Oh, okay, on the fuchsias, because they strike so easily, you don't need to use a hormone. In fact, where we cut them back, sometimes some of the leaves and with buds on them fall on top of the pots and they will root quite happily. <laughs> All right, so we, there you go. Hormones, eight times out of 10, will burn, definitely burn softwood cuttings, they will damage semi-hardwood cuttings. Hardwood cuttings, you will get away with it. But as a general rule of thumb, fuchsias don't need any Good. hormone treatment whatsoever. We're going to use what's called a dibble stick. In this case, we're just using a bamboo. Dibble means we put the hole in so we don't damage, once again, that bottom bud, or we don't break the cuttings. Well, exactly, because they're soft and they're- Because uh, they're so soft and malleable. You know, that that would easily break if I tried to push it into the medium. So. Ab absolutely, but, yeah. but also with more difficult to root cuttings, it's, the abrasiveness tends to rip the, rip the bark and yeah. let in lesions and which rot, rot, fungi may enter. We're going to use the same principle for fuchsias as all other cuttings. Pop them in three quarters of the way down. Just firm that cutting in. I like to go around the outside of the pot first and mm. then work my way into the middle. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. So you, you get a lot of cuttings for your space. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I guess you would do what I would do. You would then correctly label everything when you put it away. We, we, we have forgotten to get our labels. Oh, look, here's one I made earlier. Yeah. And if it was me, I would put the name on, I would put uh, the date I put the cuttings in. And always important when you're doing cuttings is the temperature. Mm -hmm. Because plants suffer from shock and, you know, on a really hot day, just the 
10, 15 minutes it takes mm. us to prepare a cutting, that may be long enough with no moisture getting through oh, to those mm. leaf surfaces. They may spit their leaves. If the whole batch has spat its leaf, you want to know what the temperature was on that particular yeah. day. Yeah. Always, if you can, take your cuttings on an overcast day. Yeah, so, and coolish would be good as cool. well. Early reckon. in the morning yeah. is best time. And, and yes. obviously with something soft like fuchsias, the cuttings need to be taken off the plant and put into place in their new uh, propagating mixture reasonably Absolutely. quickly. Absolutely. Don't take your cuttings and then go and have lunch. And your cuttings are going to die. Yes. And it might only take 10 to 15 minutes on a hot day. Yeah. Now, it, it does, takes. with cuttings, it does raise one other thing. Yes. My auntie might want me to take some cuttings and take them home and propagate them. Yes. Uh, but there's a simple technique, is there, not to transport cuttings in good condition if you can't put them in as soon as they're cut Absolutely off. right. So the easiest way to take cuttings from a to the propagation site is simply roll them in some moist newspaper, pop them into a plastic bag. Plastic bags are always good because they keep the humidity yeah. in the bag. Yeah. Now, having said all of that, there are some cuttings that create extra epphylene. Ep epphylene is that the rotten apple yeah. smell, right? Um, if you leave them wrapped up in plastic for more than a day, the epphylene will cause the cutting to drop its leaves. So you can't leave it for a week. No. Okay, so Stephen, let's do the switcheroonie, which yes. is three weeks. So we've got three weeks down the track. Yeah, right, there we go. And now we have a baby and, fuchsia. And now we have a baby fuchsia. Now, the cuttings we did were three to a pot, okay? Mm. This is one that I did three weeks ago, just for you guys to see at home how it works out. All right, so if we tip it let's out. Let's tip it out. Everything falls off, mm. and lo and behold, this was a hardwood cutting we did. Now that we've got our fuchsia struck, we're going to pot him into a growing medium. Not a propagation medium, but a growing medium. So the growing medium will have a nutrient level. The grow, right, so we use osmocote. We use osmocote three to four months. Now with osmocotes, you have to bear in mind, fuchsias are growing and being propagated over the warmer months. Yeah. If we get a heat wave, osmocote will exhaust itself before the three to four months are up. So we need you need to bear in mind that just because you've bought a bag of potting mix four months ago and you're now using the last of it, there may not be a lot in it. So a quick side dress of osmocote just to uh, pep your cutting help. up. We've got fresh fertilizer, however, so we're basically filling our pots. Now with fuchsias, they're fairly forgiving, so we don't need to worry too much about over potting. I don't. So a, a struck cutting could easily go into this four inch pot. We're going into a hundred millimeter yep. four inch pot, absolutely. And during the growing season, they will move and fill this within another three weeks. That will be full. Um, for some of the more difficult cuttings, I wouldn't go into a pot this big mm. to start with. Yeah, for so you'd be more fuchsias, inclined to go into something. Into a, a two small. or a three. Yeah. So basically we'll take our plant and we're going to put all of this top underneath and we're not we're not pushing its roots into the hole we've made a big enough hole to snuggle it in and we just cover it over just like that all right so and that will sit there uh and be watered in uh and left there it'll have enough fertilizer in it for a while and we can now i guess move on to show people what a plant should look like if you struck this in the spring uh what it should look like three months later absolutely so you have to use your imagination we, we have to have the before and after of course in all of these things absolutely so we've, we've just potted up a tiny struck fuchsia and you tell me that this is approximately what you should have how long after three to four months depending on the growing season yeah. so if you've taken your hardwood cuttings late in the season you'll end up with it's still it's still three to four months yeah um so whether they're spring cuttings or they're summer cuttings this is about what you will end up with so we probably would then look at a plant like this this plant is quite saleable so you could sell it on to a client they would immediately take it home and probably pot it on into something larger absolutely right so once again be it this size or be it those cuttings you saw earlier on you don't need to be too fussy about potting your fuchsias up. I would certainly go from this 75 millimetre pot into a 200 millimetre pot, no worries. So that's a, in um, an 8 inch, eight inch from pot. From a so 3 inch pot to an 8 inch, yeah. or even a 10 inch pot. Yeah. So a 20 to 30 centimetre so pot. So you could probably pot it up into the pot that it's going to stay in for the rest of the next growing season, well, potentially. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So, Peter, if I had this fuchsia now in my bigger pot, and it's grown nicely, and it's flowering, it's doing all the right things, how often would you recommend to people that they repot their fuchsias and do they always have to right. go up into bigger pots or can they pot 
them into fresh mix. How would that work? Stephen, that is a great question. <laughs> You've got them all today. Yeah. Rightio. So we let's let's use our imagination and assume that this plant has been growing in this pot all flowering season right yep. the way through. We're going into winter now. Fuchsias being the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere are going to go a bit scrappy looking. Yep. It's what they go a tropical plant is go subtropical plant is going to do in the cold yep. climate. It's not a deciduous plant, they will go semi deciduous. So the perfect time to cut back and pot your fuchsia is late winter. After your last frost or just before your last frost, yep. cut your fuchsia back. So f for argument's sake, we don't need to rub the root ball down. We don't need to tickle it mm. and, and loosen it, as some people say, because fuchsias are fibrous rooted. So they're not a tap root system. They're not a rhizome. They're fibrous rooted system. So that means all of these roots are feeder roots and they're going to make more feeder roots. All a fuchsia wants is some fresh soil and some fresh fertilizer. And really it will continue to grow in the spring. You can, however, cut it back when you pot it and fertilize it. Mm -hmm. That's what we now, tend to do here. But there is generally in people's gardens a finite size pot that they're prepared to go to. So say for instance sake we've got it up into a 25 or a 30 centimeter pot uh, and it's grown really beautifully. Uh, we don't then necessarily want to put it into an even larger okay. earth the next yep. year. Yep. How would we go about dealing with the fuchsia then? Would we then take it out of the pot and actually root prune it? So but well, no. So basically you can create yourself a bonsai. You'd, Root pruning evergreen plants, which we really, this is. Mm. People root pruning evergreens at home eight times again, 10 are going to take too much fruit, feed a root off and they're going to kill the plant. So rather than root prune it, leave its roots intact and top prune it. So with fuchsias, the general rule of thumb will be cut it back by two thirds yeah. after winter. If you cut it back during growing season, you're cutting all your flowers off. Yeah, yeah. So you cut it back after winter, just before your last frost, because it takes it three to four weeks to actually make its buds grow fertilize it and keep it in that same pot so you're basically creating a bonsai without doing all the root pruning yeah. to a bonsai so you wouldn't root prune it necessarily Matthew. <laughs> peter now i see before me two quite distinct habits this is much more pendulous this is much more upright talk to me okay so our hybrid fuchsias yep. on it. you hold the pendulous one yeah so our hybrid fuchsias come in two forms yep. they come in the upright so by upright we mean they're quite happy in the garden they'll mm. they'll, they'll grow to two three four feet i've seen some massive ones in melbourne oh me. yeah yeah look it's it's just breeding it's mm. just, just just the height is breeding but yep. so far as general moderns not the species mm. you know a meter is about where you would expect them to pull up to okay. Which so is they're two our two and a half feet of oh, two and a half three feet yeah and then they come in the hanging basket forms. Mm -hmm. So the hanging basket forms want to relax naturally. They yep. don't need any stakes. They don't need any uh, anything to any weights to encourage them down. It's just how they're bred to to grow out and down, whether they're mm -hmm. being a hanging basket or a pot. Yeah. Now we talked about pruning of the uprights. Pruning of the baskets is exactly the same. You pinch mm -hmm. them early in the season yeah. just, just to fluff them up yeah. and to force all these dormant buds to shoot out. Yeah. You get to a point where you've done enough pinching, you've got enough subframe of your plants mm -hmm. there, let it finish off and flower for the rest of your warm season. So is it true that they only bloom from new growth? Most fuchsias only bloom on current season's growth. Yeah. So you effectively have to prune it if you want you have you have to prune all fuchsias if you want no that's not true you don't have to prune you can leave them as a get very leggy. they'll get old mm. so so where where your fuchsia will drop all of its internal leaves on the old wood over winter because they want to go semi deciduous because we're growing them in a cold climate not mm. a tropical climate mm. baskets are the same so to keep them compact and keep them lush they really need a haircut each late winter after your last frost yep. into the early parts of spring depending on your altitudes and yep. your climates of course yep. and a feed same as with your standard so let's do quick general care then so you've got okay. your fabulous fuchsia they are understory subtropical plants or most fuchsias are understory subtropical under the canopy plants mm. so they like dappled light yeah we out here grow them under a 75 percent shade cloth yes ferneries like if you're thinking orchids and begonias mm -hmm. your fuchsias are an ideal bedfellows yeah so what is their hardiness where could they go okay so to... we'll take them through quite happily down to minus eight That's now they don't eight. look pretty 
They don't <laughs> look pretty. Who does in they, minus eight? No, minus great. eight, it's, it's not a good look, is it? They will drop a lot of foliage. A lot of the old wood will sit there. Mm. We prune them after that cold period. Then we fertilise them with our Osmo coats. Any of those slow release fertilisers, three mm. to four months is generally enough. Mm. We feed it twice a year. If you put six to eight months on, mm. it's still going to exhaust itself early. So three to four months, you're better to snuggle in with. Um, and, and generally, it's just keep them moist. Now with fuchsias, they don't like to dry out. They are fairly forgiving if you forget to water them. I know this from personal experience, Peter. They don't like to dry out. They don't like to dry out. They but get they crispy. Will, they, they do get crispy. Um, but with a haircut, if you happen to be a bit remiss, they will recover fairly mm. quickly. Um, so once again, we would fall back to our general rule of thumb, and that is pop your thumb into your permanent pot. And if you can feel moisture down to that first or second joint, Leave it alone. If you can't feel any moisture down that far, mm. give it a good drink until you see the water coming out the bottom of the pot. Matthew. All right, I will bear that in mind. Now, cunningly behind us is this amazing standard version, which again, from my childhood, I remember standard fuchsias and being so enamored of them. You're about to reveal the secret, which okay. actually <laughs> says that it's not that hard to achieve. It's not. I'm going to pop this one down. And I'm going to put this pendulous one okay. down. So so generally when we make, well, I'm going to use this one for a second. We'll swap okay. it in a second. Mm -hmm. um, so generally when, we, when we're making a standard, pendulous varieties are the best because they're going what? to wheat. So, oh, so those things, okay. So if we use the uprights. It's just going to be. They, upright. <laughs> well, you've got to select a, a stem first, and 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 with the pendulous, you hold. Well, here we go again. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to pick a leader here. Yeah. Um, th th they're all bushy right from day one. I see. I see. Um, so it's just a little bit more difficult. Mm. You can do them, but it's picking the varieties is a bit harder. Right. It's easier to do them with a pendulous. I would not have thought fish. that, but now you've said it makes complete sense. Complete sense. Now we had an so, example. So what, what we'll do is exhibit A. Exhibit A. So, so this is a basket variety. This mm -hmm. one's called Annabelle. Yep. Um, so I have basically picked you out one. Which is the same as Which this. is the same variety as this. I've basically this. picked you out one mm -hmm. with a strong leader now. So what we need to so do. So let's just show everyone that is quite obvious. So this is a cutting that would be how old? Oh, this cutting would be um, three to four months old. Oh, goodness. So yep. there is a lot of, there are other sort of minor branches, but then very clearly one is making a run for the hills. One's making, making a run for the hills, correct. But it also has a natural bend on it. Yep. Okay. At this point, don't worry about that. It's like starting your standard off. You don't have to get a dead straight stem. We can fix, okay. we can fix those sins in a minute. Yeah. Now, if you'd like to hold the plant, yep. I'll do the surgery. Okay. <gasps> So you just cut so everything I, off? I've decided I don't want to use this one. Mm. This one's natural natural selection. This one is showing yeah. more vigor. Yeah. So we're going to just at this point, just go down to ground level and cut everything off we don't want. Let's and then you've got a handful severe. of cuttings. You've got a handful of cuttings if you want. Put those away for later. So we still have lots of lower branches. We still have. We haven't finished cleaning it up yet. Okay. Okay. So where we remove them from, let's just get rid of the knobbly bits now. Yeah. Okay. Forget this. We don't need to worry about this right now. There's yeah. a scar left here. Yeah. We still have these guys to get rid of. It looks a little bit harsh, but we, we, we're doing this with it's an out end. Of love. We're doing it with an end product in mind. So you've got to see far enough down the track. Yeah to get back to a single stem. Yeah. We're back to our single stem now. Yeah. So what already we, we've got the makings of a standard. We've got the makings of a standard. Now with the standards, to get a polished trunk like this, mm -hmm. this won't happen in the first year, Matthew. Oh, okay. So we've got leaves. Yeah. So we need to either cut or just break out all of these shoots. We don't want to take the leaves off because we want those to keep photosynthesizing. Oh, I see, that I is see. making the goodies that the plant needs. Yeah, so right? just the growth. So let's just break. I'll go one each side so the camera can pick me up. Yeah. We're just breaking out those shoots so if we as we go. Closer. And we'll, we'll just work our way up the stem. So you're literally just pulling just, off the just branches. Pulling, just pulling them off. We're just working our way up the stem. Now, all these things you're pulling off could be tip cuttings. If, the, you, these, were... if you wanted to, absolutely. But how Goodness. many Annabelles in my house do I need? Yes. Now, the question is going to be, where do you stop? Okay, we're going to keep going. You yeah. Just keep removing yeah. as long as you can safely break them out. Yeah. Okay. I'm feeling we're getting okay. to crunch point. We're getting up to the point now where they're getting a little bit, like the stem has now become softwood and yeah. the cuttings are quite soft. 
I'm not going to risk breaking them out now because I have a feeling you will break the tip. Yeah. So just where you can safely get them out, mm -hmm. remove them. See this little fellow here? Can the yeah. camera pick that one up, Matthew? Well, let's go a little There's, closer. It's, it's just a wee bit small. So if we yeah. try and get our big fingers or our secretaries in there, it's likely we're going to lose our terminal shoot. Leave all of the rest until they're big enough to break out okay. without losing your tip growth because right. it's really this tip now that we're going to pot up we're going to pop the plant up now and we're mm. going to pop our stake in mm -hmm. and this with some fertilizer is going to keep growing so everything that we've taken off down here it will continue to go on okay up. and as they get of age we can break them out very exciting so should we go and pop this and stake it all right let's go and do it all right okay all right peter pop right. me a stand okay so i'm just going to tip it out back here because we're going to bash it about on the table so you okay. need to be aware now we're going to pop the fuchsia we've, we've prepared it let's not break it already so, so the tip, we need the tip is the important thing to keep it off the ground and, and to maintain its health yep and okay. I, i'm also steadying the stem with my other two fingers so. okay so just a quick pot up it's, re yeah. it's really like we're, we're leaving two fingers around each side to get it settled in and we'll, this is we'll, the same mix this that is, you were using. This when is you the same, the, the same, the same mix as we went for without cutting. Yeah. Now, the first thing that I will point out is I'm not in the centre of the pot. No. The reason I've deliberately not got in the centre of the pot is because remember that bend we had in it. Well, I was going to actually say, how do you cover up the scar? Because I noticed in the the finished specimen, the trunk <laughs> is coming clean out of right. the soil, and so, this one here. Yep. So, so we've so you're covered. It. We've covered our scars. <gasps> now, for some time, there's going to be shoots appear down here. Yeah. You just break those off again. Right. right? And then just when you keep pot it. it again, you can place it in the centre of the pot. Yep. Absolutely. Oh. This, this, we all we, the tricks of the trade. We are just starting now. I haven't quite grabbed a long enough stake, Matthew. What are we going to do about that? We're going to stop and get a long stake. Oh, we have a taller stake. <laughs> Okay, so now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the stake right down the side of the pot. Now, yeah. we don't have to worry about injuring any roots because we've put its base over the other side. Yeah. Okay, okay so we've put a, popped our stake in. It's really just a matter now of securing the stem to mm -hmm. the stake. Now, you can use twist ties. There's all sorts of things you can use. Mm. I use these little guys because they've got a bit of give in them, Matthew. Yeah. And the, st the, the leaves that we've left on yeah. will hold the tie for us. Uh -huh. So basically... Okay, we, we have clipped it here. Now, and are you going to, do we try and straighten that or? We're going to pop another clip on it here. Yeah. I'm leaving this. So by the time it's about this long, it'll you then will add another clip. be ready to clip right. and stake I see, it I in see. there. So okay. a bit of a droop with your training is it, not an yep. issue. No, none whatsoever. If I try and clip that now, it's going to break. Yeah. Um, it's going to grow fairly quickly. So fairly quickly, that beautiful specimen over there, the same type, how old is that? Okay, so they're in their second year. They did the, he the head the first year out. Wow. Um, so that's once, quick. once again, we've removed the growth. We also can remove the flowers now. We don't want it to put its energy in flowers. We just okay. want it to grow. All right. Okay, so we, we really. Sorry, are. Annabelle. If you don't feel comfortable taking these little guys out because that little shoot there, and the camera probably won't pick it up, but mm. you'll have to believe me, it's about a quarter of an inch long. What's that, four to five millimeters long? It's going, that's where the plant's growing from. I feel confident enough to rip those flowers out mm. because I just don't want it to waste energy. In about three weeks, it will have made enough size to pop that one up there. Yeah. These will be big enough to break out and our next tie on. Basically, you get it to the height you want. Then you have to think, now, if I take the top out of this fuchsia, it's going to branch from the top of the stake down mm. so you have to think far enough ahead mm. to go i want my fuchsia standard 60 centimeters high and mm. then i want my lollipop on the top so you need to take your fuchsia exponentially above the six inches and so how much growth would you and have for the weepy bit I, I look i would leave another 10 to 20 centimeters okay okay so four to ten inches yeah. sort of thing okay so that's 30 centimeters mm. um, and then each of those leaves will shoot away mm. once you get it to the desired height you pinch the top out. That forces all of the buds to shoot away. And then you have to start and the then process the of ones. taking all the buds out and go. then leaving them up the top. Genius. Ingenious. So once the first eight or nine have shot away out there, we have mm. to use our imagination now. Mm. You nip them back. If you don't pinch them, the weight of the flowers on the young wood will break those that top out. Now you did mention earlier on when we were talking that the double flowers are quite heavy and that if you standardize the double ones you can actually snap the stem and I think we've got one over there that 
We've got one over there where the the An chute, thing the, chute the chute hit the top of the stake went went it's ten centimeters or twenty centimeters over the top of the stake and then a windstorm went through and it broke the plant over. But let's go and have a look because it's uh, done let something me show you interesting. So you showed me this earlier and you can see quite That's, clearly there where the leader the, the, the almost wind, snaps. Yep, the wind got hold of it and broke it and you can see because fuchsias are fairly forgiving, it's knitted itself back together. Yeah. And I was going to throw it away and it, it didn't look it didn't wilt, so we've given it But now it's like this beautiful it looks and, quite sort of Japanese. We well, hold it up. Stunning. It's, it's almost it's it, well it's 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 doing it, but it's done it with a with a thirty five degree bend or whatever there degree you go. Is. Now, I did notice another um, variety up here, which I want to ask you a question about because it has relevance to me. Oh, okay. let's go. Let's have a look at that. All right. Matthew, this you one's should. important to you, I it believe. It is, Bonacord. So before I met you, here's the story. You're being um, a bit fresh now. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, my other half and I have a ha we've bought a house, which we're renovating, and we discovered that the name of the house was Bonacord. Right. Yep. But it had been chiseled off the pediment because it was so notorious, it had been used as a brothel in the oh, late right. 19th century. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how I was just Googling Bonacord. Fuchsia Bonacord popped up at White House Nursery, which is you, before I knew you. And in fact, before Steve and I started our YouTube channel. So I ordered from you, sir, a fuchsia bon accord which is now doing quite well i have actually learned quite a lot about what i should be doing in terms of repotting and, and pruning anyway cool but what i've noticed i've got about 10 fuchsias mm -hmm. some species and mm -hmm. hybrids bon accord is the only one that gets really heat affected so about six weeks ago we had a really really hot day and the leaves just crisped up but the other ones right next to it didn't yep. is bon accord sensitive righty ho so. um so loosely the orange fuchsias okay Arakan, if that is orange uh, i am the aga khan i'm it's, just saying it's, it's fallen into to the the oranges okay there's it, it if, if you use imagination it is getting into if oh, all right look up there does that that looks orange doesn't oh it? goodness okay, me. okay so so anyway. basically the oranges are more susceptible to the to basically the fungal attacks fuchsias get so mm. fuchsias have two groups of things that attack them. Yeah. One are the bites, chewies, and suckies, mm -hmm. and one are the airborne um, rust problems. And, right. And so, so let's go with the rust problem first, okay. because bon accord. Yes. Okay, so we'll get rid of the one I sent you. Yeah. And, and we'll come to a bon accord now. A, a lot of fuchsias, the oranges, as I have said, are mm. more susceptible to rust. Now, rust is that orange-looking build-up you get on your leaves. Can you see that, Matthew? Can so you hang see on. That? Yeah, I can, can see you it. See that orange yeah, yeah, yeah. You can certainly see it on the okay. tops of the leaves as well. Right. Let's just hold yeah, it You can that see the way. scars with it on the tops of that, the leaves. The, yeah. The leaves are discolored. Now, now basically the leaves with rust on them are going to fall off. Yeah. Um, it's best to, if they're pot grown, it's easy to pick your pot up and shake it in the bin and get rid of them. If it's mm. in the ground, a quick rake around them. The, as far as fungals, is a little bit of black spot and a little bit of rust. It's mm. really like roses. They, right. they have pretty much the same problems with fungals. Problems. And would you use the same treatment as you would roses? Absolutely. So, okay, so. Now, then we come to the bites, chewies and suckies. Yes. So it's the same old garden culprits. It's aphis. I can't show you any because we have a little team of, of, of gleaners that fly through here and clean them up. Yeah. It's grubs. Once again, my, my local wildlife take care of them. Then we get uh, a thing called leaf miner. Now, leaf miner is a little tiny thing. You can't see it. Mm. It's, its mother lays its eggs on the leaves. You'll never see the eggs. And it shows up. See, Matthew, where it's burrowing? And see the white that's yep. left through the leaves? It just chews its way through the leaves. Yep. Um, and there are the white fly, the greenhouse white fly. I get white fly like there is no tomorrow. Okay, so the best way to avoid white fly and rust is plenty of air circulation mm. and you'll notice we we have a fairly well ventilated so mine are outside area. they're under cover yeah. but the 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 sides are, you are open you've got a courtyard there it is quite enclosed yeah, yeah. okay so it's not getting it's not good windy. airflow right. yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. so the best cure is it doesn't matter which country you're coming out of there are multi-purpose sprays that are registered for fungus and insect control, mm. okay? So when you're selecting a, a, a multi-purpose insecticide, fungicide, you need to find one that's a, registered in your country, yep. under your country retail names, but it needs to be registered for fuchsias or for out 
store ornamental plants. Okay. Now there there is a couple of uh, of, of home remedies. Um, with my cypress begonias, we do use a lot of bicarb of soda and a little bit of white oil. Mm. Um, it tends to be fairly good as well. Oh, okay. okay. What would the... so, so the ratios yes. we we use around about two and a half teaspoons of um, bicarb of soda to basically a gallon. So what's that, about five litres of water? Mm -hmm. And we use about a teaspoon of white oil in that mix and we just water it over. We, we tend not to use chemicals. Uh, look, there are some organics you can use. You can use pyrethrums, they're all the pyrethrums. Yes, I... But basically because of the magpie and the wildlife we have do its job through here, mm. we tend not to use anything. And the, the little bit of white fly I get I live with, a little bit of rust, we clean the plants up once a week. Okay. Um, so most of it you can live with. There you go. Um, it, it, is, it is also important to say, if you're in a cold climate, mm. don't water your fuchsias and let them sit cold and wet at night because it, it just helps those, right. those fungal problems. A little there bit. you go. Well, I think we have covered just about everything with fuchsias, but we should go and find Mr. Ryan and we should dine on the berries of fuchsias because that is the end note. You can eat them. Right, fuchsias, yes. Fuchsia let's go and have a fuchsia salad. Okay, let's have lunch. So, fuchsia salad. Here we go. Are we yes. gonna go, we're self-sufficient in, in fuchsia. So if we just pluck the forbidden fruit right. and let's show everyone what fuchsia seed pods look like. Now, before we eat them, why wouldn't you try and grow them from seed? Okay. You can. Fuchsias can be grown from seed, but we don't have another four hours for me to show you. And once again, because fuchsia hybrids are hybrids, 99.9% .9 of the seed that look like seed in there, they're going to be sterile. Ah. Okay. So um, it's those that germinate them. are likely to throw back as well. So you'll end up with something inferior, um, potential. Yeah. All right. More than likely. Mm -hmm. um, now, before before you try, I've had them before, so I know what I'm in for. I'd like you to have that one, Matthew. I, that's chivalry okay. here. But yeah. can I just say, though, that, so I've, I've grown fuchsias for years and years, always seen the berries and thought, oh my goodness, they look so toxic. Mm -hmm. And they're not. So here we go. All right. <gasps> <laughs> okay, so now like a lot of these Nothing! Things, describe mm -hmm. that flavour, sweetness, but nothing Vaguely like, mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're really hungry, it'd probably save your life up with yeah. the water content But the... That one's not quite as right It kind of tastes like wet green It's, it's like, describe the flavour mm. of, of nothing. dragon fruit mm. It's yeah. sweet, but not sweet, yeah. but it's yeah. sweet, but nothing flavor. But it's interesting because the New Zealand species, the big tree one, mm. it's called yep. a carter the Maori actually gave names to all their plants. It's the only plant that has two names, one for the plant and one for the fruit. Ah, right. And okay, so yep. it was obviously a really important fruit plant uh, mm. uh, for the Maori. Have because you tasted it? That name? Yes, and yep. it's slightly sweeter than this, but basically on the same level. Sweet, nothing. Yeah. Sweet. Well, we have now eaten of the forbidden fruit, which is not that forbidden. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for showing us your fuchsias right next to the begonias, which you can still see in the background. I have loved this. Have you loved this, Stephen? It's right? been great fun, and I think we've given fuchsias their right of uh, passage here. Good. We've shown people how to use them. Good. We've shown them how to look after them. And hopefully this video will, in fact, engage with people all over the world and get them excited about fuchsias perhaps again. Good. Yes. Yeah. So yes, they deserve it. Thank you very much. You'll have to specialise in something else now so we can come visit you again. <laughs> okay. Um, the hot date would be late September to mid-October. I'll have a surprise for you. Something oh, my goodness. I've been breeding. You heard it here first. So if you want to find out what Peter's doing in spring of this year, you'll have to hit subscribe and find out Absolutely. what the cliffhanger answer is. Stephen, if anyone has a question for you, put it in the comments below and we'll try and answer it in our Monday shorts. Exactly. But until then... Right. Well, thank you very much, Peter. It's been a delight to be here yet again. And I hope... <laughs> so, that's the future. <laughs> anyway, I'm still alive. Carry on. <laughs> Can you tell we have fun? Yeah. <laughs> Did it, you no, I, on it. it's killing me softly. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye all, and I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, video. Join us again next week. We have videos every Friday, and don't forget to press the uh, alert button so that you'll be reminded. See you next week. Bye all. Thank you.